Hey YouTubers and healers out there, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I want to talk about how we learn to invalidate ourselves and how that plays into the narcissist's ability to operate effectively in our lives. I want to start this video off with an article that I found about two years ago called, Here are four ways we're accidentally teaching kids that consent doesn't matter. And I'll plug the link to this article in the comments down below in the description box. Uh, but it's by Darcy Conway, and she's speaking to someone named Paige, so I'm not really sure who the author is, but it struck me so profoundly that I, I saved it, and I'm glad that I did because now I'm able to share it with you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and actually read this article to you all, and then make a brief kind of analysis of it and how this plays into the bigger picture of narcissists. So it starts out, we all want our kids to learn about consent. We want them to know that no means no, and only an enthusiastic yes means yes, as they grow older and get into sexual relationships. But I think one of the things we might be missing is that we've been undermining the idea of consent since they were very young. And so, even when we get to the point of explicitly teaching them about it, it's really not that strong of a teaching because all of our other reactions with them have possibly undermined the idea of consent. So I'd like to talk about four ways that parents sometimes teach kids that consent does not matter. Number one is tickling and other types of rough house play. Now I think that tickling and being silly and pretending to eat my kids feet is one of the greatest parenting skills out there. So I definitely don't think tickling is bad or rough housing is bad. I think the important thing is that the minute your kid says no you stop. Even if you know they're kidding, teach them that no means the other person will stop. They'll learn both that their no matters, and they'll learn that if someone says no to them, they should immediately listen. Now with my kids, I know if they say no and I stop, they'll come and put their foot back in my mouth because they really didn't mean no, they want me to keep chewing. It was just a game where they pull their shirt up again to ask me to tickle, and that's fine, so we end up keep going on, but I do immediately listen to the word no. Okay, the second way that we sometimes keep, teach kids that consent doesn't matter is by contradicting their feelings. Now this is an aside from me. I think this is huge and I think this is super major in terms of how the narcissist is able to operate with us. All right, back to the article. I think it's a huge problem because it just comes on naturally. And I talked about this before where a kid says, I'm cold and we say, no, it's no, no, you're not. It's hot in here. Or I'm hungry. No, you're not. You just ate. I'm tired. No, you weren't. You just got up from your nap. I think that we, you know, in our minds as parents, we know what? Why are they saying this? They can't be hungry. They just ate. But by saying so, we teach them not to trust their own instincts and their own feelings. That's huge. I'm going to read that again. But by saying so, we teach them not to trust their own instincts and their own feelings. And then these are feelings that we want them to trust when they're in their 20s in a situation that they're not feeling comfortable with. We want them to trust their gut reaction. So instead of contradicting kids, we can just ask them an open-ended question in a neutral way. Here's another one. I hate grandma. That's a type of thing that really triggers us to be like, no, you don't. Don't say that. That's my mother. You love grandma and grandma loves you. You know, you can immediately start spilling out all of these denials of their feelings because we don't want them to hate grandma and we probably know that they don't hate grandma. But the thing is that contradiction of their feelings isn't helping the long-term goal of having them trust their feelings. So once again, I just ask an open-ended question like you do. I think grandma really loves you. Or last week you had a lot of fun with grandma. Are you sure? Okay, so I don't really think she's giving the best examples for not invalidating the kids because she's still kind of invalidating them in a way, but I get where she's going. All right, so I'm going to try to get through the rest of this article because it's kind of painful. It's a transcript of a video, so it's not exactly an article. It's just a transcript, so here we go. The third way that we sometimes teach kids that consent isn't important is through forced hugs and kisses, and this is all along the lines of teaching politeness. We want them to give Uncle Joe a hug and kiss when they see him because he's their elder and it's important to respect him in that way. And because he wants a hug and a kiss, 
regardless of how your child is feeling. And the idea of being that if they don't go give Uncle Joe a hug and a kiss, it reflects poorly on you and that your kids are rude or standoffish or whatever. And we worry about that as parents. And so then we end up, whether it's by force or coercion, getting our kids to hug and kiss someone they don't want to. How many times has that happened to you, you guys? This is a huge red flag. You know, we don't want our teen daughters or teen sons to be in a sexual situation where they're feeling like they really don't want to continue, but they feel like they can't say anything because they've come this far and it would be rude to stop or that type of thing. That's exactly the problem we get in young adults with not asking for consent, but also not being able to bail out because you don't feel that you have the place to say, no, I'm not comfortable with this. We need to stop right now. It's very important not to make your kids hug and kiss or shake hands or anything like that with someone that they don't know if they don't want to. If they don't want to give a hug or a kiss, they can just wave hi or they can blow a kiss, whatever is comfortable in your family for some type of non-touching related greeting. So in other words, what she's saying here is when we force kids to go up to people and give them hugs or we let people hug them and they're trying to pull away and the person is hugging them tighter, it's teaching a child that what I want for my boundaries and my body doesn't matter. It's, it's what you want. And because you're an adult and you have more authority over me, I have to listen to you or I'm going to get in trouble. You know, some kids probably got spankings for not complying with an adult's desire to touch, hug, or kiss. Even though those are not sexual in nature, the child still has boundaries, even at a young age, and yeah, we don't want our kids to be rude, but we also don't want them to learn that someone else's desires for you overrides their own. Okay, back to the article. Also, you don't have to force your kid to greet someone they don't want. We are often forcing our kids to hug relatives that to them, they don't even remember, very distant relatives. And we wonder why sexual abuse is so frequently a family member and why the kids didn't tell mom and dad when they've been taught their whole lives that they should respect their elders, that they should be giving physical affection to family members. So it becomes very hard for them to say, I was touched in an inappropriate way. This one has a very big implication right now for child sexual abuse. You really want your kids to know that they could say no and they never have to be touched in a way they don't want to be touched. And also for when they're older, so that they feel like Whenever they get that feeling in their stomach that I don't want to do this next thing, I don't want to be touched in this way, they know that they can say no. The fourth way that we sometimes teach kids that consent doesn't matter kind of plays like the last one and that's just generally respecting your elders. Right now on Pinterest, a very popular article is getting pinned a lot about the interrupt rule. And this is a rule that kids instead of interrupting you when you're on the phone or you're talking to another adult in person that you teach them to put their hand on your shoulder so that they know you need them and you can put your hand back acknowledging that I acknowledge that you need me I'll be just a second and it teaches kids not to interrupt now I don't particularly have anything wrong with that rule interrupting can be rude and it's very polite to interrupt in a nonverbal way if you can and it's also important to teach kids the difference between an emergency and something that maybe can wait for a second because you're on an important call. So I don't have a problem with the idea of teaching your kids the etiquette of interruption. However, the article talks about never interrupting adults because you need to respect your elders, and that terminology really rubbed me the wrong way. The idea that because someone is older than you, that what you think matters less is nothing but a power play. It's teaching them that the person who is older, bigger, stronger is more important than what they want. And then we wonder why sometimes we have adults that are in abusive relationships when really we've modeled for them that size equals power, age equals power, and whatever characteristic there might be equals power. And that means that your ideas are less than that person who has the power. So in other words, this is where we're teaching kids that if someone has a position of authority over you, their thoughts, their feelings, their desires matter more than yours, okay? The other thing being for me 
is that respect is something that's earned. It's not automatically given. And I don't mean that you should be completely rude to someone until they've proven that they're worthy of your respect. I'm also teaching kindness towards everyone. But this idea that someone, just because of their age, automatically should be deferred to without trusting your own thoughts and feelings about that person is just false. So once again, I'm not against the interrupting rule and teaching etiquette about interrupting, but I am against using the reason that you respect your elders. It's kind of like using, because I'm your mom and I said so, it's not teaching them anything. If anything, it's teaching them that power is the most important thing in the world. And if you have power, you can force it on other people. And that's not really what we want to teach. So I think respecting your elders is just kind of a lazy shorthand that doesn't do what we're hoping that it will do. Those are the four ways that we sometimes teach our kids that consent is not important, that you might not be thinking of. In addition to explicitly talking about consent as it applies to sexual relationships as your kids enter their teen years, think too about how you're treating your one and two year olds and how you might be undermining the concept of consent even at that age. And I think you'll have a kid that's much better prepared to hold their own and trust their instincts, sensing no when they mean no, when they're teenagers and onto adults, okay? So it says her name is Paige, it's been Gentle Parenting Answers, and I will post the link to this article in the video. I know that was kind of long, so thanks for hanging in there with me. But I think this is an excellent example of where the roots of you softening your boundaries and learning to invalidate yourself begins. It starts as a child. I know a lot of my friends and people I grew up with were forced to eat all of their food. Now really think about that. You know, they're forced to eat everything on their plate, even though their body is telling them that they're full. No more. I can take no more. And they're forced to swallow every bite until they're in pain or sick. Forced to go play with a group of kids who they may not like because they're cousins or family members or something like that. Think about the different ways that as children we were taught your boundaries don't matter. What you want doesn't matter. And the reasoning that we were giving behind that was the person was the adult or the teacher or whoever, but they were in charge of you. They were in charge of your thoughts. You don't need that. You just had X, Y, Z. You're not tired. You just woke up telling you what you're not telling you, telling you what you are. So is it any wonder that people grow up and have a total lack of self-esteem, lack of self-awareness? lack of self-assuredness is there any wonder their whole lives they've been told who they are and who they are not when i was a freshman in college i thought i wanted to pledge a sorority right and within the first day on the line they just started telling us who we weren't you guys think you're smart you're not smart you think you're pretty you're not pretty you think you're important you're not important you're nothing like just started tearing us down like from day one and i was like oh uh, -uh i'm out of here and i i quit i dropped the line and i know that that's like taboo in the college world but i had just looked at it and i said you know what if this is how we're starting if this is how we're already beginning this relationship i can only imagine what it would be like once you cross because then they probably think they own you for life. And I just wasn't into the idea. So I, I got out of that quickly and I was really glad that I did. But think about these things and really think back on your past. And when did you first start learning to invalidate yourself? How are you still doing it today? A lot of us are doing it. We talk ourselves out of things. So we meet someone, they do something wrong. And then we immediately start going, well, maybe I'm being too judgmental. Maybe I'm being too harsh. You know, maybe I'm, and we start talking ourselves out of how we feel. We agree to do things that we don't wanna do. We agree to outings we don't wanna to go to. We spend money we don't have because we don't want people to be mad at us. Because when we were little, people got mad at us when we, when we said no. So think through these things and really take the time to pause and detail where this behavior comes from in you. Identify it so you can start to fix it so you can start to tell yourself, no, this is how I feel. This is how things are to me. You won't even need to bounce it off of anybody anymore because you'll be validating it within yourself. So you won't need anyone's help 
to, to agree with you because you'll agree with yourself. That's really the goal here. Learning to agree with yourself, learning to deprogram all your no's and all what you meant to say and you couldn't say it because you were little or you were young or whatever. So I'm going to post the link to the article in the description box. Check it out if you get a chance. And I appreciate you listening. And going forward, just if you have an instinct, don't worry about whether it's right or wrong. Trust your instinct and act on it. And over time, you'll learn to really believe in yourself and trust who you are. Take care, everybody. Be safe out there.